borrower needs to know who they're supposed to be negotiating with. <laughs> <You're right? laughs> um, the note has to go first, and the deed of trust is simply incident to that transfer. If you just get transferred the deed of trust, you got nothing. When I down at the courthouse yesterday, I can't believe what I saw. They've totally obfuscated who actually owns what, depriving Ms. Pardo of her ability to actually negotiate with the note holder and come to some agreement. Originally, the note holder was uh, the, the land home. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then land home assigned it allegedly to who? We have no idea. Oh. <laughs> that, that's the problem. That's why we're here to get discovery to figure out what happened. They, as we allege, they go into the MERS system, which is designed, or at least as a part of it, as a function of its design, to obscure who actually owns what. Yes, absolutely. And we cited uh, Carpenter v. Logman and... So the problem here is that the note holder was home service and, and the deed of trust, the deed of trust holder was MERS. Correct. So that's a problem. A problem. Yes, ma'am. So they're supposed to be the same. Right, exactly. Uh, and, you know, I, I just want to respond to counsel's argument that plaintiff doesn't have standing to contest the assignment. Defendants introduced the assignment as evidence. Plaintiff, as a party to this case, has the ability to challenge that evidence and to say whether or not that's actually what it, they say it is. We, you know, the, in their in their initial arc, in their initial motion, they argued that because the deed of trust was transferred to them, they also got the note. But under Carpenter and under Bain, that's not how it works. It's the other way. The note has to go first, and the deed of trust is simply incident to that transfer. If you just get transferred the deed of trust, which from the language in the assignment of the deed of trust, that appears to be what happens, you got nothing. I mean, Aquin's problem should be with MERS for transferring it a null assignment, a null deed of trust, a nullity, excuse me. They didn't give her notice when the, uh, when the note or partial interest in the note was sold to Fannie Mae. Or potentially Aquin, if they're now owning it. We don't really know. How did, where did Fannie Mae get it from? We have no idea. <laughs> this is the problem. You know, we, they put it in this MERS system, it goes behind this curtain, who knows what happens to it, and it gets spit out on the other side, and all of a sudden they say, here I am, I'm the beneficiary, let me take your house. I mean, a, a borrower needs to know who they're supposed to be negotiating with. <laughs> <You're right? laughs> um, a borrower needs to know who they, are, who they need to be negotiating with. They have to know who the note holder is, because otherwise, they might pay the wrong party. And under well-established Washington law, if a borrower pays the wrong party, or an agent of, the, of, or a, of a wrongful agent, say, they're on the hook for those payments. Are you, so the loan servicer is not the person that they would negotiate with? They might. I mean, but if, if Aquin is saying, we're servicing this on behalf of the note holder, and all she has is the note which says the note holder is Land Home Financial, she's going to think, I need to be, I'm negotiating with Aquin, who's negotiating on behalf of Land Home Financial. She doesn't know that the note went to Fannie Mae. And, th and that, that is the injury, is that she can't negotiate with the party she's supposed to be negotiating with. She has no idea. And does she have damages flowing from that inability in this case? Yes. She, her, she failed, she wasn't able to negotiate with the note holder, and they took her house. I thought you were saying there was some little tracking going on. That's, that's, that's another damage. So I, I, would, I think that's a separate breach where they, you know, Aquin stringing her along saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to modify you. you know, we're, excuse me, we're not going to modify you. We're going to give you a loan modification and we're going to, you know, get you out of this foreclosure. Meanwhile, they're telling the trustee behind the borrower's back, keep, let's move this foreclosure train along. And meanwhile, That was not my reading of the statute. I thought it was just the elements of theft with that extra intent to resell. Theft of property from a mercantile establishment with intent to resell the monetary gain. Was that the provision we said? Unfortunately, I don't have the RCW in front of me. That let's see, we we cited get the complaint. So we cited nine A eight two O one O four O O. 
9856340? Correct. Yeah, the, the theft with intent to resell we Sorry, were citing was 9A.82.010 and then OO. There's a lot of it. Also amounts to mortgage fraud. Uh, so with, with that in mind, not only do should uh, defendants' claims for attorney's fees on that fail because we've read, you know, these are reasonable allegations, that, that claim should survive a 12B6 motion. We've met, we, you know, we've provided facts and alleged that all of these acts of, these, uh, these acts of criminal profiteering have occurred within the past five years. The defendants seem to want a full-blown trial brief. They're entitled to, under, eight, under CR 8, a short and plain statement of the uh, facts giving rise to liability which is an inelegant way of quoting that rule I'll represent. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the complaint, plaintiff isn't required to prove her case. She's just required to give notice to the other parties that here's what I'm claiming and this is what we're going to be arguing about. And now, you know, the defense seems to, you know, be, a, uh, takes issue with the fact that each defendant isn't individually named in each cause of action. For, First, I posit that the criminal profiteering and civil conspiracy sections explicitly say defendants. In addition, every cause of action reincorporates every previous allegation as if it were, ple as if it were pleaded therein. The effect of that is MERS's and MERS, well, I'm not going to get into MERS part, we're jumping the gun. MERS, Fannie Mae, and Aquin are named in each individual uh, cause of action because each cause of action incorporates everything that came before. Uh, and so with that, I, that's, I'd like to give time back to the defendant to counter points. I'll be as brief as I can, Your Honor. Um, slowing down for a moment, the big question here, is, there seems to be a question raised by a plaintiff about she didn't know who to pay because there was a question about who owned the note, but she, she doesn't allege that she didn't know to, who to pay. She, doesn't contest that she stopped making her payments and she doesn't contest that she did an attempt to enjoy the sale. With regard to the role of the different parties, the request for judicial notice lays out all the recorded documents. So there was a recorded deed of trust, the recorded uh, that named uh, the original lender uh, and MERS as a beneficiary uh, as a nominee for the original lender. There's the assignment of the deed of trust, uh, which is exhibit B to the judicial notice. The assignment doesn't say that MERS is the beneficiary, it just says that it's assigning the deed of trust as nominee for the lender um, from the land home to Auckland. Once Auckland becomes uh, the- uh, What does that mean as nominee for the land home? From my understanding, Your Honor, it's essentially a, an agency type of relationship. So are they now the lender, or what? No, uh, they, the, uh, under the original deed of trust, they're given the power to assign by the lender. So with that power, the, I, I don't want to add facts to the record, Your Honor, but under the documents that are in the record, uh, based on the deed of trust, they assign the deed of trust uh, to Auckland in their capacity as nominee. So you agree, though, that Bain said that MERS can't be a beneficiary? I, not exactly, Your Honor. And the reason I make a point of it is Bain answered a specific question, whether or not MERS is a beneficiary if it never held the note. And I would argue that if a party doesn't argue that MERS never held the note, then Bain couldn't apply. Well, the note itself says that, doesn't say that, that MERS is holding the note, right? That's, that, that's what it says, Your Honor. So therefore, if, if we have the note, right, and they don't say anything about the, the, whole, the holder of the note being MERS, then, then MERS doesn't hold the note, right? I, I, I follow you, okay. but I think the, this goes back to the question of who, whether or not Auckland ever possessed the note. And I think the argument that you were raising with regard to the definition of beneficiary, as Trujillo talks about it, as Bain talks about it, is the question of how that term is defined within the Deed of Trust Act. Not just one particular section here, one particular section there, but the definition of what, what does a beneficiary mean. And it's, plaintiff sets out three steps, but as, as I read the rule, uh, a beneficiary is party or entity that is in possession or holds the note. 
do you agree with, uh, that the note holder and the deed of trust holder should be the same person or entity? Yes. And they weren't in this case? I don't think that is required. I don't, I don't believe that argument is made. Well, you did make it. Do you, do you agree they're supposed to be the same person or entity? I bet that's correct, Your Honor. They're not supposed to be split. And they were in this case? I think there's an allegation that they were. Well, no, because the notes held by Home Financial are near the notes held by Mars, right? Well. The DOT, the deed of trust is held by Mars, and the note is held by Home Financial. So that's not a problem? At, I believe what Trujillo says and what the case law says and statute says about what is necessary for a party to foreclose, like Auckland to do the foreclosure, is that Auckland must be the beneficiary under the statute. And the statute refers to uh, the note and refers, or specifically to the security agreements. And there's, my reading of the complaint is that plaintiff does not allege that Auckland did not hold the deed of trust or did not hold the note. The assignment from uh, MERS to Auckland uh, specifically says that all rights under the security agreements and the deed of trust are assigned to Auckland. But do you agree that if MERS didn't have the note, when it made his assignment of the deed of trust to Auckland without the note, that that would not be valid then? I can understand that argument by plaintiff, by plaintiff, Your Honor, but well, I- you just say there's supposed to be, there's supposed to hold both. In order for the foreclosure to move forward, Auckland need to uh, hold both the deed of trust and the note, that's correct. But based on the recording, set, recording act, I don't believe there's any requirement under the statute or any case decided that uh, make it necessary for that assignment of deed of trust to have been recorded or that somehow makes Auckland not the holder of the note and the deed of trust. And this goes back to the alleged damages and causation plaintiff is claiming that apparently that because of this error that she should be able to have the property back, but she there's no allegation that she didn't know who to pay. She, there's no allegation that, again, Auckland was not the holder, not just that Auckland was not the beneficiary. And if she wants to make those allegations, she should have the opportunity to do so in a minute complaint. Again, address a few more points Sorry. briefly. Uh -huh. uh, I'm to which is generally talks about the views of assignment generally. But Carpenter B. Logan. Uh, Trujillo and Bain, it appears to have no real application to the case of R. And briefly touching on waiver, uh, in their response, plaintiff relies on Opal Walker and the Bain case uh, to argue that those cases support, for example, voiding uh, the deed of trust. And that raises the issue of the, whether or not those cases are distinguishable, which brings in supplemental cases like Frizzell, which talk about waiver. And we argue that like opened the door to the waiver argument in a response. That's okay. all I have, May I make just two very quick points and I'll come. So I first want to address the nominee argument. Uh, in Bain, the Washington Supreme Court said, just naming MERS as a nominee does not give rise to an agency relationship. And in fact, we've also pled allegations that it's not uh, MERS being the agent of Land Home Financial. MERS actually controls what goes in, what does or doesn't go into the deed of trust. They require the MERS to be named as the beneficiary they require the as necessary clause, which purports to allow MERS, not the trustee MERS, to foreclose on the property, which is in direct violation of the deed of trust, uh, and among others. So there's, it's just by listing MERS as the nominee doesn't automatically give rise to an agency relationship. Uh, further, you know, counsel attempts, to, excuse me, defendant ex uh, attempts to distinguish the Carpenter v. Lockham case by saying, well, there are different, uh, more recent Washington appellate cases. The Supreme Court of the United States is the supreme law of the land. Unless it, they, they interpret the law that applies to all 50 states, including Washington. I am not aware of any authority that allows for a 
state appellate court to overrule a United States Supreme Court decision. And I'm also not aware of any authority that says just because a case was decided 140 years ago, that means that it no longer should be followed. I'd argue that a lot of our very big cases were, argued, were decided many years ago, and they should be followed. Under principles of stare decisis. That's all I got. Okay. Well, um, you know, on the waiver, uh, I'll, I'll just say, you know, the statute you were, you were talking about, 621.4040, um, it, it does say that uh, failing to object to a foreclosure, sale, and bring a lawsuit may result in waiver and challenges to the validity of the sale. Uh, it doesn't say shall, it's may, and it's really um, that the court does consider equitable, equitable circumstances. Um, and Babin, which I thought I copied, but I guess I didn't, said Babin v. One West Bank, I think the plaintiff cited that. A waiver doesn't occur if the actions of the trustee are unlawful. So mm -hmm. the, what they're arguing, I think, is that the sale is, the actions are void, and that the actions are void, they're claiming, because MERS um, was named as a beneficiary of the trust. Uh, it's clear that the note holder was not MERS, so therefore, MERS uh, was not the holder of the note. Uh, Land Home Financial is the holder of the note, per the note, and by the way, the note and these other documents, I think they're all attached to the complaint. As it uh, so, MERS is not the beneficiary um, under Bain. MERS purports to assign its interests under the deed of trust to Auckland, uh, but MERS does not, it's not a valid beneficiary, so I don't know how it can assign its beneficiary rights to Auckland, plus it didn't have the note to assign to Auckland, which you know, I think we've all established today, you have to have, you have to be the holder of the note and the deed of trust. So if o Oakland is not a valid beneficiary, then, then Oakland doesn't have the authority to appoint one plus trustee services as the successor trustee, um, and without the proper appointment, Northwest Trustee Service that doesn't have the authority to conduct a trustee sale. So the sale's void. Um, so that's that that's my where I came down on this the, the waiver issue. Um, and you know, here we are looking at all of the facts, and, uh, taking all of the plaintiff's claims in the complaint is true, including all reasonable inferences and even all hypothetical. So, um, I think we're, I don't know about, I, I think that some of this is very, uh, very highly technical. Uh, this, but what I gleaned from all of this is, um, I, I don't think anybody talked this morning about whether or not they're entitled to have a motion for declaratory judgment. So I guess we've all agreed that there's a justiciable controversy here. And so we'll, We'll proceed with that. Um, the violation of the Deed of Trust Act is again that Mer MERS transferred the, the Deed of Trust to Auckland but not the note. Uh, also, that the trustee violated his obligations of good faith to the plaintiff because he you owed know, duties to the beneficiary, Auckland and Fannie Mae. Now, again, you may disagree with that, but I'm happy to take it as true for purposes of this complaint. Um, under the CPA, the, the unfair or deceptive act was that. Again, Auckland lacked authority to appoint the successor trustee and who initiated the foreclosure and the dual tracking. Um, plaintiff asked for a loan modification and was unaware that Auckland was also foreclosing at the same time. Um, I interpret plaintiff's uh, sub subsection 20 in the deed of trust that um, if, if it seems to me the mortgagee needs, the, more, the person taking out the mortgage needs to have some notification of when there's a change. And there's, it's clear that the plaintiff was not notified when the, the note was transferred from Auckland to Canada Bay. In fact, no one knows, as I understand it now, even when that happened or how that happened. Um, the criminal profiteering, I think plaintiffs can see that the, the resale doesn't apply, right? Good theft with intent to resell? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So you need to have three or more persons that are alleging Aquin, Fannie Mae, and RCO slash Northwest Trustee Services got together, they organized and financed this pattern of criminal profiteering, and I have to take as true, the theft is 
the attempt to take her house or the taking of her house. Um, the extortion is threatening to take her house. Um, the money laundering would be using money from unlawful activity. Um, and uh, the mortgage fraud would be misleading the borrower during the lending process, making misstatements and misrepresentations. Assuming those allegations in the complaint are true, then the motion to dismiss, with the exception of the theft with intent to resell or Did we did we cover MERS Corp or not really? Not, not yet. Really. yet. Okay. All right. Let's go on to MERS Corp. Should we just prepare orders all at the end? Yeah. May I take a moment to go get a drink of water? Sure. Would you like me? I'm good, but thank you. Those claims is also denied. Okay, which one did I not mention? Equitable relief, civil conspiracy, and negligence. Right. Um, the allegation of civil conspiracy was uh, when Aquan and Fannie Mae directed Northwest Trustee Services and RCO to foreclose on Aquan's property. Need to have two or more people entering into an agreement to accomplish an unlawful purpose. So if the end result was unlawful, which we have to assume it was, when Aquan and Fannie Mae got together with Northwest Trustee Service to foreclose on Farmer's property. So that's that. You want to ask a question? Yeah. Does that also apply to MERS? I don't think we're talking about MERS right now. No. No, we did allege that MERS was a part of that criminal, or excuse me, civil profiteering when they agreed to. You mean civil conspiracy? Excuse me, yes, civil conspiracy. When they uh, assigned the DOT to Aquan? Yes, ma'am. That was them being a part of the conspiracy to take, or to affect the unlawful trustee sale. All right, so MERS is part of the civil conspiracy. Are you, you're not, are you alleging any negligence against MERS? Uh, that they purported to be a beneficiary when they weren't in violation of the DTA which uh, under Schofield, uh, the 1945 case we cited, constitutes negligence per se because it's an injury to property. negligence claims as far as Northwest Trustee Service and RCO that they violated, that they owed her a duty um, because the trustee is supposed to act in good faith for the borrower. Um, and uh, they're uh, alleging that, she, that the trustee is biased. Okay, so that, and then, I'm sorry, equitable report is on page I, I hesitate to interrupt. Can you clarify? I heard you mention Northwest Receipt Services and RCO and the negligence. Did you also say MERS as well? Are you alleging MERS? That's negligent? Yes. Yes. They are. Okay. What was I just talking about? Uh, MERS. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Northwest Receipt Trustee Services and RCO. And they're saying, you're saying MERS was also negligent because they are the ones that listed themselves as the beneficiary. Correct. Potentially awkward if they're claiming to hold the note. Um, at the time we filed this, we were unaware of those claims. Uh, so, with the equitable relief, I think MERS comes out of that. The equitable relief the plaintiff is asking for is to void the sale of her home, which you know, that, that, that goes to the RCO, Northwest Trustee, and uh, Fannie Mae Apple. So, you're saying uh, MERS is not, you're not claiming anything about MERS under the equitable relief, right? Correct. Is that the only one that you're agreeing about first being out? 